Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's, today's webinar, which is shining a light on deep seabed mining. Uh, we are very delighted that we have a whole great panel of experts here today. Um, so we ran this webinar earlier today. Um, we had a lot of really engaging participants with great questions. Um, and really what we're trying to do here is to um, not only shine a light on deep seabed mining, but also on the recently uh, adopted IUCN resolution uh, calling for a moratorium on deep seabed mining. Uh, last year in September um, 20, 2021 in Marseille, we held a World Conservation Congress. Um, with, this is where the General Assembly will meet and actually is IUCN's highest decision-making power. And that's when our members vote on several motions and then they adopt it, they become IUCN policy. So uh, of the resolution that we have, it, more than 81% of the state agency members voted in favor for a moratorium uh, and more than 95% of uh, the non-governmental organization were in favor for moratorium. So what does it mean? I mean, deep sea bed mining is really going to be, it's on the agenda. It's, it's a very debated topic at the moment and it will continue to be so, especially this year, because it's, it's a year when a lot of the international meeting, which has been postponed because of the pandemic, are now resuming. So, for example, we have the SABSTA resuming, SABSTA, SABSTA of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is resuming in March. We also have the BBNJ Treaty, both very, very relevant uh, meetings for on, related to deep seabed mining. So, without further ado, so we will talk about this later. So, the, the, the purpose of this webinar is really to kind of get different stakeholders of more in-depth and insight, both what are the issues surrounding deep seabed mining. So it's not just the environmental uh, context, environmental impact, but it's also socioeconomic and political and also the, the kind of legal and the governance structure. So what we'll do, we'll start up, we're gonna have Pippa, sorry, Pippa Howard from uh, Fauna and Flora International, which joining us. And what she will be doing, she will really be setting the scene in terms of the environmental context. We'll look at, you know, the deep sea, that mining typology, but also talking about the intrinsic value of these um, very, very uh, special and vulnerable habitats. We'll then move forward to uh, listen to Christina Yarda, who's our high seas uh, special advisor. Um, and she will kind of provide the legal context, but also look at it from an equity point of view. Uh, following that, we'll have a short presentation from Matt Gianni. He's joining us from the Deep Sea uh, Conservation Coalition. So he will be talking about the governance structure around this, the governance and also from, from a financial liability point of view. He will then hand over to uh, his colleague, Sean Owen, and she will provide the social context, because I mentioned it's not just environmental implication, it's very much a socioeconomic issue as well. Um, so after having the, the socioeconomic context, um, previous today, we had Jessica Battle joining us from WWF. And what Jessica really looked at is, do we really need this? What are the potential alternatives to deep sea minerals? Unfortunately, Jessica couldn't be with us for, for this um, session, um, but we will have Sean uh, provide, uh, giving her presentation um, with some kind of really concrete commitments looking what the private sector has done. And then we'll have, uh, we'll welcome uh, Torsten Chile from the Global Ocean Trust, who will join us and moderate a Q&A session where we're really looking forward to um, hearing your questions and that can be addressed to any of the speakers. So we suggest that you actually put your questions in the Q&A, so not in the normal chat, but please put it in the Q&A and we will be addressing those later. So with that, I hope and I really look forward to a really engaging conversation with everyone. And once again, thanks for, for joining us. So I think we, we're ready to, to kick off. And um, so I will invite Pippa Howard, please. I'll give you the floor to you. So if you can share your screen, it will be great. And we we'll also pasted the full IUCN resolution in the chat. So you can have a look on the resolution and moratorium for deep sea bed mining. Over to you, Pippa. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nina, and hello to you all from Cambridge in the UK. Well, the deep sea is a vast, pristine and largely unexplored area with rich biodiversity and complex biophysical systems that support, for example, the global carbon cycle and climate regulation. And there are around two, three, 
300,000 species of marine plants and animals that have been scientifically described. But this represents just a small fraction of the number of species that are likely to exist. Now, even, even, even seemingly inhospitable environments have become uh, have been found to support an array of highly specialized life forms that have evolved to thrive in extreme conditions of the deep sea. Now, while our perceptions of life on Earth are skewed by our daily encounters with photosynthesis, which supports life on land, the deep sea is fundamentally different um, as an environment where sunlight really just doesn't get anywhere below about, you know, 50, 60 meters. In deep sea environments, energy for life is generated through chemical reactions, which are used to create the building blocks of life. And this productivity fuels life in the oceans. It drives its chemical cycles and lowers atmospheric carbon dioxide. Now, hotspots for biodiversity in the deep sea are often associated with deposits of rare minerals, which may be associated with key geomorphologies such as hydrothermal vents and sea mounts. Movements of current and migratory animals connect all parts of the ocean, making conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and ecosystems both complex and dependent on interconnectivity. Marine geosystems are as diverse and dynamic as terrestrial ones, but they're far more expansive. Changes in ocean systems can have global repercussions because the oceans are connected to, each, to one another. The water masses from different seas mix. Most ocean ecosystems have no obvious physical boundaries. The deep sea ecosystems are globally important for our fisheries, for genetic and evolutionary processes, for regulating our climate and maintaining ocean chemistry and primary productivity. In a process referred to as the biological pump, ocean biology is responsible for the storage and um, of more carbon away from the atmosphere than on land. And complex physical and biochemical processes underlie the functioning of, these bio of the biological pump, uh, balancing ocean chemistry and associated key trace metals that are fundamental to life. These same trace metals are at the core of deep seabed mining. So the International Seabed Authority at the ISA, the international body responsible for managing the seafloor beyond national jurisdiction, has granted 31 exploratory deep sea mining contracts. Most of the contracts are held by state-backed companies, including those linked to India, South Korea, the UK, China, Singapore, Poland, Russia, and Japan, and as well as some small island states. And there are three main mining typologies which are being pursued. Polymetallic nodules, um, manganese cobalt crusts, and seafloor massive sulfides, or, which are hydrothermal vent systems. These are distributed across the planet as shown in this figure, with most activity taking place in the Western Pacific in the clarion clipperton fracture zone, but also in the Mid-Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. So let's take a quick look at each of these typologies. So the first one is polymetallic ferromanganese nodules from the abyssal plains. Though the abyssal plains were once assumed to be vast desert-like environments, research shows that they teem with wide, a wide variety of microbial life and other large, uh, larger creatures. The microbial communities thriving on nodules in the seafloor are key to the food webs of life in the abyssal plains and in the ocean as a whole. New scientific evidence suggests that microbes on the polymetallic nodules fix trace metals onto the nodules, forming over tens of millions of years. This removal of trace metals from the seawater is likely to stabilize ocean chemistry and maintain healthy ocean conditions. Polymetallic nodules are targets for mining, and they, uh, the, the metals targeted are cobalt, titanium, strontium, tellurium, copper, nickel, zinc, lithium, aluminium, and cadmium. And mining would result in the removal of, removal of entire substrates and associated ecosystems. The second type is cobalt manganese crusts from seamounts. Now seamount uh, systems are biodiversity hotspots, which host more than 1,300 different species of animals. Some are unique to the seamounts themselves. Seamounts create obstacles that shape ocean currents and direct deep nutrient rich waters up to the surface. They are fertile habitats for diverse communities of marine life, supporting important fisheries and a diverse range of marine megafauna, such as whales and turtles. Seamounts are associated with cobalt-rich ferromanganese crusts, 
which are seen as a potential source of cobalt, nickel, platinum, manganese. Mining would result in the removal of entire substrates and the associated ecosystem. Thirdly, polymetallic sulfides from hydrothermal vents, seeps and sulfur massive systems. Now, deep sea hydrothermal vents and seeps represent one of the most physically and chemically diverse and demanding biomes on Earth. Globally, the active vent system is, or systems are rare habitat, comprising an estimated 50 square kilometers. And these support high levels of endemism and hold significant ecological importance. They're also really important carbon sinks. These ecosystems are vast genomic repositories, a unique pool of potential for the provision of new biomaterials and medicines and genetic resources. But hydrothermal vents create polymetallic sulfide deposits, which are usually uh, rich in copper and zinc, as well as silver, gold, lead, manganese, and cobalt. They are a target of deep sea mining. Mining would result in the removal of entire substrates and associated ecosystems. Now, we don't yet understand the fundamental biological, geophysical, and biochemical processes of the oceans. The implications of disruption of these processes requires very precautionary consideration. Determining the environmental risks and impacts of mineral extraction depends on the knowledge, a lot of knowledge, information, and data. A considerable level of knowledge is still needed to be acquired to assess and manage sustainable e exploitation. This may be entirely impossible. The potential for environmental impacts through mining the deep sea was recognized decades ago, but there are growing concerns about our ability to define, to measure and mitigate these impacts. There is evidence for significant and currently immitigable impacts of deep sea bed mining on biodiversity. Large scale habitat removal and associated loss of biodiversity, including systems that underpin primary production, carbon dioxide and trace metal sequestration and cycling will all be part of these impacts. It will disrupt ecological function and behavioral ecology of the deep ocean species, smothering fundamental ecological processes of a vast and difficult to predict areas. Now the application of the mitigation hierarchy, which proposes to avoid and minimize and restore impacts are impossible in, in the deep ocean and cannot, we know that deep sea mining cannot be effectively mitigated or managed. So without further ado, it was great with great pleasure that I'm going to hand over now to Christina Yada with the IUCN Global Marine and Polar Program. Thanks very much. Well, thank you so much, Pippa. It's um, always illuminating to see the complexity of life on the deep sea that, um, and to recall that when the Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated, we really assumed it was deep, dark, and so remote from our daily lives as to be absolutely inessential to our um, society. And now we know that it, in fact, it is uh, entirely intertwined with ourselves as a global community and with many of the important biogeochemical cycles that we rely upon. Um, so I'm, as a historian, I'm gonna focus on the legal historical context for deep sea mining in the area and why the expectations for deep sea mining are higher um, and help to set a new bar for activities in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, as this little critter on nodule um, field represents is that the original context and hope for seabed mining was that we were going to be lifting one another uh, from poverty, that there was a new um, context and hope for solidarity, equity and stewardship underlying this notion of the common heritage of mankind which um, provides the foundation upon which the legal regime for seabed mining in this area beyond national jurisdiction is based. As we'll see in the next slide, I'm going to be exploring the where, the what, and the how this revolutionary concept has helped to set the groundwork for our future discussions. Um, it's important to recall that the Law of the Sea Convention in 1982 basically redrew the map of the ocean. It defined the um, exclusive economic zones, the economic um, rights of states out to 200 nautical miles, as opposed to the three miles that it had been prior. 
um, it defined the extended continental shelf in red that actually allowed um, coastal states the clear right to exploit the uh, resources of the continental shelf, um, both mineral and the sedentary resources. And then this international seabed area covering essentially 60% of the seafloor uh, that was deeded as a permanent legacy of all of humankind. And of course, not to forget it's the high seas water column above, which is still ruled by the traditional notion of freedom of the seas, which is causing many of the environmental pressures that we're all suffering from and that marine biodiversity is suffering from today and that seabed mining could introduce a whole nother world of pressure. As we'll look into the next slide, is that um, it's fundamental to recall that the 1982 Convention on the Law of the Sea, the part 11, is premised on the notion that it's the area as well as its resources that are the common heritage of mankind. We tend to forget that it's the area itself that is part of the common heritage and then focus instead on the um, extractable mineral resources from the seabed. And that's where most of the attention has been currently um, placed. But the challenge is that the concept, as we'll see in the next slide, of the common heritage is really much um, bolder, uh, more um, encompassing, and more visionary. It actually says that no state has the right to claim sovereignty or sovereign rights over any of the resources, that the rights are vested in humankind as a whole, that there is no right of access to the seabed mineral resources other than through an international organization um, that would be um, managed uh, and comprised of the parties to the Law of the Sea Convention. Through this common management, states were dedicated to acting on behalf of humankind and for the benefit of mankind as a whole. Uh, also dedicated to peaceful purposes, the first arms control agreement, many would say. But how this is implemented in practice, as the next slide shows, is that it's important to recall what this benefit of humankind means. It's not just about the equitable sharing of the financial or economic benefits from seabed mining, though this was um, a key part of the package, uh, but it's also about that solidarity and equity and participation, the advancement of de developing states so that they could participate as equals in this great adventure great enterprise of seabed mining, because when the Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated, we thought that we had the technologies available, that there was no life on the deep sea floor, and that this was going to be um, a, an immediate economic boon for all states. But at the same time, it was recognized that the International Seabed Authority, as well as states parties, had an obligation to advance marine scientific research, marine scientific knowledge, engineering techniques, um, and to bring along and engage developing country partners in this process, in large part, so we could actually meet the other requirement for seabed mining, which is assuring effective protection. Article 145 of the Law of the Sea Convention actually requires that the necessary measures be taken by the International Seabed Authority, by states parties, to ensure protection, meaning protection and preservation of, um, uh, from harmful effects uh, from, that may arise from mining related activities. This included uh, prevention, reduction, control of pollution, interference with ecological balance of the marine environment, um, the protection and conservation of natural resources, as well as the prevention and damage to the flora and fauna of the marine environment. This is not just the marine environment of the deep sea bed, but also obligations with respect to the marine environment in the high seas water column above, uh, from the, the very surface up to the top, 4,000, 6,000 meters deep, but also obligations to um, ensure effective protection to um, other states, the coastal environments. So today we are faced with the challenge of going forward as the next slide shows, is that we have multiple benefits that we could, or in fact are receiving from the international seabed area. And these mineral resources are just one very small part of the picture. Um, they're being amplified by some voices um, outside as well as inside the International Seabed Authority, but I would suggest it's important to take a step back to provide us 
ourselves with the breathing room to really think about what are we trying to get from the international seabed area? Are we really able to provide a mechanism to advance the interests of developing states in becoming full partners in understanding and managing areas beyond national jurisdiction? Are there sources of wealth that could in fact help to lift many states from poverty? How can we better support other uses and other users of the seabed? Can we in fact recognize and better encompass cable laying? For example, fiber optic cables currently span 1.3 million kilometers of the sea floor and may be in um, one of the first direct casualties of seabed mining if we don't necessarily plan and incorporate what other users are doing. And of course, there's untold ecosystem services as Pippa so eloquently described. And of course, those new sources of scientific knowledge that are helping to enable us all to better manage this vast area of the seabed as well as the water column above in the context of accelerating impacts of climate change, of the deoxygenation, acidification, uh, and marine heat waves that are taking us to a new world that only that the brave and the knowledgeable will be able to tolerate. So I'm hoping that we put the context of, you know, what, it, what are we sacrificing today if we rush into seabed mining without full knowledge of what we can gain by leaving the seabed alone, as well as what we can lose if we do not. So thank you very much for your attention. I will look forward to the questions later. Thank you. Over to Matt Gianni, my colleague from the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. Thank you, Christina. Um, I'll be discussing issues related to the governance uh, aspects of deep sea bed mining in the International Seabed Authority uh, area with the primary focus on the uh, deep abyssal plain and the mining of nodules, which is the area and the type of resource uh, that is of greatest commercial interest in the moment. Next slide, please. First, though, just to say that uh, the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition is a coalition of over 90 organizations worldwide. We've been uh, working to conserve both deep sea and open ocean ecosystems. Next slide, please. Um, as I think Pippa indicated, uh, uh, there have been a number of studies that have come out and basically to say that biodiversity loss from deep sea bed mining would be unavoidable, irreversible on human timescales and offsets in the deep sea are scientifically meaningless or deep sea biodiversity. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the area in the Eastern Pacific where most the majority of the exploration claims have already been issued by the International Seabed Authority for the polymetallic nodules, 17 exploration contracts, an area roughly similar to the size of the continental United States, about 4.5 million square kilometers in size overall with about 1.3 million square kilometers already leased for exploration that could be converted into exploitation or commercial mining licenses. Next slide, please. The size of each of those mines uh, would be roughly estimated to be about 10 to 12,000 square kilometers. This is approximately a third the size of the nation uh, of the country of Belgium. There would be an expanded footprint uh, resulting from the plume flows on the deep seabed of another one to three times the size of the actual area mined, 30 to 40,000 square kilometers. And the plume flows in the water column from the discharge of wastewater, uh, sediment and mining have been uh, estimated to, to be able to uh, kind of flow through the water column before the, these, these, this particulate matter settles back on the seabed. Uh, up to 1,400 kilometers away from the actual discharge sites. So impacts of sediment, wastewater, noise, and light on fisheries, migratory species, and the biological carbon pump, both on the seabed as well as in the water column. And I might add here that each of these mining licenses, you, you've heard um, uh, estimates or, or claims that the world needs three or four or five times the amount of metals such as nickel, cobalt, and copper found in the nodules. Uh, to transition to renewable energy economies. But each of these mines, you know, in spite of the fact that they will be huge, far bigger than anything we've seen on land, would only produce about 0 
0.1% of the copper currently mined terrestrially today, less than 1% of the nickel mined terrestrially today, and for cobalt, about 4 to 5%. Next slide, please. So you'd have to do a lot of mining in order to actually make a dent in international metal supplies. Uh, uh, there have been studies, which uh, Sean will get into after me, but to indicate that deep sea bed mining is not needed to transition to renewable energy economies. Next slide, please. And uh, in addition to the environmental concerns, there are some significant structural and political concerns regarding uh, the way the International Seabed Authority has been set up and, and, and operates. Uh, uh, number one is a lack of transparency in key aspects of the ISA's work, and I'll use the acronym ISA. So the contracts that the International Seabed Authority issues to mining companies or countries that wish to mine are completely confidential. Um, they're not publicly available, even though they're being issued on our behalf uh, for the benefit of humankind as a whole. Um, the meetings of the Legal and Technical Commission, one of the most powerful bodies within the ISA structure, are held behind closed doors, and only summary reports of the decisions and recommendations of that body uh, are issued uh, on an annual basis. Um, once the mining regulations are adopted by the ISA, they haven't yet been, ad been adopted, but there is a push on to adopt them uh, in um, the next year and a half. It will be very difficult to prevent mining if the Legal and Technical Commission recommends it, even if a majority of countries are opposed to issuing a mining license in a given place to a given company uh, for a given particular, a particular ecosystem or area. The ISA is both regulator as well as beneficiary, financial beneficiary of the licenses uh, is a clear conflict of interest. And there are bureaucratical and institutional momentum to mine on the part of quite a number of uh, countries involved in the process, but the, uh, a, a lot of apathy on the part of many governments uh, that are members of the ISA. Um, an example of this is only about half of the member countries of the ISA attend annual meetings of the assembly, the supreme body of the ISA. Next slide, please. Um, there are use it or lose it incentives uh, in, in the uh, amendments to the mining regime established by the Law of the Sea Convention uh, in, uh, that were adopted in 1994. A sponsoring state can trigger a two-year rule, in other words, jump the gun, even if the regulations are not yet adopted. Um, but that's an open debate, and again, one that is, going, is playing out over the course of the next year and a half. And all 167 ISA member countries are guaranteed an equal opportunity to obtain mining licenses, either for themselves or for private companies. Um, and if this was a question of, uh, this was an issue, a fundamental or a foundational principle of equity that all countries should have equal opportunities to mine, not just the wealthy countries with the financial wherewithal and the technological capability to do so. However, knowing what we know now, if every country uh, that applies for licenses, granted a license to mine, it could be catastrophic. Uh, and our view is that the economics are likely to drive the development of deep sea bed mining and this industry if the first companies or countries uh, that are granted licenses make a profit, uh, others will want to jump in and the ISA will have a very difficult time to say no to any country that applies for a license. And currently, although all countries are supposed to have an equal opportunity, 25 of the 31 exploration contracts that have been issued to date by the International Seabed Authority are in the hands of only seven countries and three companies um, uh, based in uh, Belgium, Canada, Switzerland, uh, and, the U and, and the US, actually. Um, so the question is, how is this, the, 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 the promise of equity is not yet, it, it certainly is not being realized. Quite the opposite, it, it appears that it's basically the wealthy countries and multinational corporations that are kind of jumping into this, uh, into this uh, business uh, at the expense of, uh, the, rest of, the, uh, of the rest of the world. Next slide, next slide please. So, um, moving toward a conclusion, uh, in our view, the seabed mining is incompatible with the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, it will likely cause significant adverse impacts, weaken the resilience of deep ocean ecosystems, and cause damage from which these ecosystems may never recover, in addition to biodiversity loss. Next slide. 
Um, and it's not just the IUCN resolution or the NGOs that uh, are part of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition or others that uh, are saying that, that, that you know, that, that others you'll hear about, they're saying this. But for example, the UK House of Commons Environment Audit Committee has concluded that deep sea bed mining would have catastrophic impacts on the seafloor. Uh, the Seabed Authority uh, has a clear conflict of interest, and the case for deep sea bed mining has not yet been made. Next slide. And again, here we have the European Union, uh, the European Parliament, rather, in June 2021, also calling for a moratorium uh, and, uh, on deep sea bed mining and to be sure that no uh, marine biodiversity loss nor degradation of marine ecosystems should be permitted to occur as a result of any deep sea bed mining. Next slide, please. Uh, growing support for moratorium. I'll skip this. Sean will be uh, my uh, will will be uh, going over this. Um, and finally, just to say that while some have questioned uh, a moratorium, um, it, it it is in fact legally defensible. It should be required under the application of a precautionary approach, and it's consistent with contemporary commitments to protecting biodiversity in the environment. Um, so what is the future role for the USA? What are we calling on states to do with the ESA, ISA as part of the IUCN resolution and, and coming from other quarters, reform of the ISA to direct it away from scientific research designed to develop the mining industry to promoting and conducting marine scientific research to better understand the deep sea and its role in planetary, regulating planetary uh, uh, climate processes and, and cycles knowledge that would provide incalculable benefit to humankind, much more so than any value that these deep sea metals uh, or mineral resources would contain. And this discussion we're having today and the IUCN resolution that was adopted in September are very timely because the, the International Seabed Authority will be making major decisions within the next one to two years over whether they're going to adopt the exploit or, uh, exploitation regulations and be open for business or whether they're going to put a pause on this process and rethink what it is that countries uh, should be doing in relation to managing deep sea activities in light of scientific information we now have today but was not available to the negotiators in the 1970s and in light of uh, commitments that have been made to protect biodiversity and halt and reverse biodiversity loss. Next slide, please. So thank you. Um, and this is just a set of, uh, 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 there's been quite a bit of press uh, or media articles on deep sea mining in the news, and we would encourage you to, to have a look at some of that. Um, and let me hand over to uh, Sean Owen, my colleague from the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And hello, everyone from Amsterdam. So we've heard about the call for a moratorium, which is effectively a pause on the push to mine the deep seabed. We've heard that there are strong concerns around the environmental risks and threats. We've heard that there are issues with scientific uncertainty. We've heard that there are issues with the governance structure. A fourth concern around whether we open the deep seabed to mining is the question of social license. To share with you an expression of, of, of concern around a call for a ban on seabed mining, I'd like to hand you over, I'd like to share with you a film that was produced about a year and a half ago in the Pacific region by the Reverend James Bagwan from the Pacific Council of Churches, who can speak more eloquently to, to this call than I can. Nisambulavinaka and uh, greetings from uh, Suva, Fiji, where the uh, Pacific Conference of Churches Secretariat is based, along with many other regional civil society organizations. It is my, uh, my honor and my task today to share a Pacific collective position on deep sea mining. That is, it is not needed, it is not wanted, and it is not consented. As Pacific Island people, we acknowledge that the ocean is the living blue heart of our planet. It is our common heritage, but also our common responsibility. We are its guardians. We recognize its significance and its essence as the basis of our Pacific identity and well being. We are the ocean. In its preservation, we are preserved. For millennia, our ancestors have held this, this mantle of stewardship embedding the wisdom of their resource management and conservation practices into their culture and traditions. 
their vision was always beyond their temporal needs. The survival and well-being of future generations was central to their view of the world. So as custodians of the responsibility to protect the ocean against exploitation and destruction in our time, we as Pacific Islanders have a sacred and long-standing legacy to uphold. Our forebears have on this frontier stood firm against the ruinous incursions of nuclear testing, of drift net fishing and bottom trawling and marine pollution. And against impossible odds, they united to move a world to adopt a nuclear ban treaty, a ban on drift net fishing and the London Dumping Convention. Awareness of the connection between climate change and the health of our oceans gathers momentum globally. Deep sea mining is the latest in a long list of destructive industries to be thrust into our sacred ocean. So the Reverend picks up in this film that was produced a, about a year and a half ago for a, a, an environmental conference in the Pacific region. It was produced in the context of a call for a ban on seabed mining by the Pacific Blue Line Collective, which represents the churches, women's groups, indigenous groups, and a number of community organizations. Next slide, please. And the, the themes that the Reverend picks up on echo what we've heard from Christina and our other presenters in terms of the, the deep ocean, the, the resources in the deep sea being our common heritage for which we all collectively have shared rights and responsibilities. And those rights and responsibilities apply also to the impacts that the decisions that we make today will have on future generations. Next slide, please. So we're hearing the, the call from, from the Pacific groups, from, from the civil society groups, we're hearing that echoed around the world. Dr. Sylvia Earle, one of the most renowned deep, sea ocean, deep ocean scientists has also said, join us in saying no to deep sea mining. Similar language to that of the Reverend. It is not consented, it is not wanted, we don't need it. What we do need, she says, what we do want is a healthy ocean. Next slide, please. Dr. Earle is one of over 600 marine scientists and policy experts who have signed a statement calling for a pause on deep sea mining. This is a two page statement in which they list out a number of the, the uh, points that you heard from Pippa earlier on about why the deep ocean, why a healthy deep ocean is so important to all of us and what the risks and threats of, of compromising it by opening a vast new extractive frontier would be. Next slide, please. In addition to the scientists, we're hearing more and more from the fishing industry as the as understanding builds, as awareness builds about what this threat is to our oceans and to the living resources that so many depend on for income and for food security and for protein sources. The fishing industry increasingly is coming out, also calling for a moratorium on deep sea bed mining. Next slide, please. As Mina mentioned in her opening comments, over 500 civil society organizations in September last year in Marseille voted in favor of a moratorium, the resolution 122, which we can discuss later on in, in, in the question and answer session. And you see on this slide here, that's over 95% of civil society that were present at the Conservation Congress last year. Equally, as Mina said, over 80% of the government agencies present also voted in favor for a moratorium. The chorus of voices is growing, it's strong and growing. Next slide, please. And this is another beautiful quote that I wanted to share from a Maori colleague. The seabed is our mother earth and if she is disrupted, so too is the ocean and as are we. And this is what we're hearing. The more, the more we share the story, the more that people are understanding what is being proposed the more resistance and the more shock and horror there is about why at this moment in history, when we're all recognizing more than ever before how interconnected we are with each other and we are with our healthy planet, how much, how important it is to make the right decisions for how we protect and manage that planet. Next slide, please. As the Reverend noted, social resistance has succeeded in stopping and reversing a number of damaging environmental and damaging practices. And equally in preserving and protecting, for example, the Antarctic in the name of peace and science. So it has happened, 
Uh, and we have been capable as a global community of making the right decision for the global commons for today and for future generations. Next slide, please. So the question that we are faced though is, if we don't mine the deep sea, how can we provide for our future mobility, energy, and connectivity needs? How do we meet the demands of the future? And the answer is that there are alternatives. And we'll just close this presentation then, and I will take off my Deep Sea Conservation Coalition hat and put on the hat of my colleague, Jessica Battle from WWF. Uh, and, and what I'd like to share on Jessica's behalf is what business is saying is the technological and the business response. Next slide, please. So what we are hearing uh, in addition to the range of voices calling for moratorium that I've just shared with you is that business as well is starting to opt out of the, even the concept of minerals from the deep sea in the future. So here we have a list of a number of groups, a number of companies uh, who have in the past year signed on to a call for a moratorium or who have who have pre-divested effectively and said that they will not be using minerals from the deep ocean if they ever become available on the market. And interestingly, this includes some really important companies such as electrical vehicle manufacturers, the BMW Group, the Volkswagen Group, the Renault Group, Rivian more recently, all of which are supposed to be the end consumers of minerals that would be potentially mined from the deep sea. So what is it that they know that we don't? Next slide, please. What is happening in the world is a massive and rapid accelerated push in technology development. So every time we open a paper, every time we open the news, there's new information about rapid advances on battery technology, on either reusing minerals that are already in the existing supply chain or reducing the need for certain minerals or potentially even phasing out certain minerals that are currently necessary. So there's a whole new generation of batteries and technology coming on board. We can't even know for sure what the battery of the future is gonna look like in five or 10 years time. So how can we make a decision to, to open up the seabed to these vast multi-thousand square kilometers of, of extraction and destruction of strip mining that Matt was talking about? when we've got such opportunities for recycling, for reuse, for re re reduction, for redesign. Next slide, please. And so these companies and many in the financial industry as well are effectively walking the talk of the sustainable blue economy. And the sustainable blue economy is one that restores, protects and maintains the natural capital upon which we all depend and which we are increasingly and excruciatingly aware of how much damage we've all done to. In addition to us being now in the middle of the decade of ocean science, it is also the decade of restoration. And now is the time for the sustainable economy principles to kick in and, and, and the companies that we're seeing making this commitment to pre-divesting from the deep sea are doing exactly that. Next slide, please. Uh, and if you can just click one more time, thank you. So to wrap up, what we're seeing is, is a call from industry, from the private sector, and, and increasingly, and we're hoping for increasingly, pressure from the private sector, from these companies on governments and on regulators to take the right decisions in terms of the potentially irreversible impacts of seabed mining and call now for a precautionary global moratorium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sean, um, for the excellent presentation and for being flexible and covering Jessica's presentation as well. Um, so it's a, it's a lot there. So for everyone, um, um, there might be some that I saw have joined a little bit later. Uh, we, we started off and we've had a set of presentations. So really going from the uh, and setting the scene in terms of the environmental context, uh, the introduction to deep sea. Um, habitat, but also the complexity as well as the three different typologies and really 
zooming in on looking at different unique habitats of the deep sea, such as the abyssal plain, sea mounts, uh, deep sea mounts, and hydrothermal events. Uh, and then people highlighted that there's the most physically and chemically diverse biomes on Earth. So very, very, um, it, it's, it's quite intriguing and really to see this and, and the intrinsic value, but also highlighting the risks and the impact. So I think that framed it very, very nicely. And then moving over to the kind of the legal context as well, uh, provided by Christina, uh, not just going beyond, you know, equity um, uh, and um, equitable sharing. Um, and then, you know, also what is the role of the International Seabed Authority and the mandate, etc. cetera. Um, again, going beyond environmental and really looking at the political and structural uh, aspects of it. Um, so I thought that was really helped the presentation that was given by uh, Matt uh, Gianni from the Deep Sea uh, Coalition, uh, Conservation Coalition, pardon. Um, and I think, you know, they're a member of IUCS, one of our members, but they're also a membership organization themselves with over 90 non-governmental organizations, fisheries organization, but also having law and policy uh, institution involved with that. So that's, again, a very extensive network. So really happy um, to not only have you here with us, but all the work that you do to kind of safeguard uh, the long-term health and integrity and resilience of deep sea ecosystems. So thank you very much. And then again, it came over to looking at the, the social license and I very much enjoyed the video, a very heartfelt uh, video that was presented and, and so very true and talking about our sacred oceans. Um, and that's often overlooked when we look at these things, it's really to think about the cult and in inherited uh, you know, cultural values of the ocean. So, um, and then um, I think the, the last component is really to look at, but, but then what are the alternatives? We, we know it's rich in all these valuable resources. Uh, what could potentially be uh, an alternative? And quoting Sylvia Earle saying that we don't want it, we don't need it, but what, um, what are the alternatives? So I think that was a very important aspect, bringing in the, the sustainable blue economy, uh, which obviously is looking at circularity and circular economy, and what we can do and really based on old linear transaction of economic uh, development. So um, I think Jessica was on the call earlier, also mentioned that um, had a potential theory that the, in, in terms of get the most return on investment, that was an incentive to kind of the rush, which she, which she explained earlier. So um, I think this is um, perfect time to kind of stop here and now also handing over to uh, Torsten Thiele, who will be moderating a QA and a uh, for the next almost 40, 45 minutes, um, and we'll be taking some, some questions from the floor. So I can see that we already have some questions, so that would be excellent, and there were some really, really good questions, which I think, um, you know, a lot of our panelists would be, be able to, to address. So without any further delays, uh, Torsten, if you can, I'll give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mina. And yes, indeed, we already have some interesting questions taking us in different directions. So I think I'll start with one that links very nicely to what you just quoted on the circular economy and that links to, to Jessica's slides, because obviously we want all transition to a clean, green economy. And we've looked at these opportunities around circularity and around alternatives. But there are, of course, also issues about um, environmental aspects on terrestrial mining. And um, what evidence does the panel have to show that by keeping the marine environment uh, intact through more term, that we will still be able to, to achieve this transition? And I think. Um, we might go to Matt first because you showed uh, some information around uh, research that made that point quite clearly that these metals are not required from the deep sea. But that is really an important point of discussion that keeps being brought up. So Matt, maybe you you want to go and start on that question. Yeah, thank you, Torsten. Um, there are a whole range of answers to that. I think Sean touched on quite a few of them, uh, as did Jessica in her presentation that Sean made. Um, let's, let's let's give a couple examples. Um, number one, you hear, for example, the the metals company, one of the companies that's the strongest proponent of deep sea bed mining, and it has three licenses of the seventeen that the ISA has issued so far for the nodules. 
they're looking primarily at selling nickel into the electric vehicle market. Okay, and they claim that uh, the world is going to need 50 million tons of additional nickel uh, in order to build 1 billion electric vehicles uh, in the next 30 years, primarily to, to put the metals in the battery. As it turns out, um, the, there is a new technology already in place for batteries, lithium iron phosphate, as opposed to lithium manganese nickel cobalt batteries. Um, and the iron phosphate batteries do not use any cobalt nor any nickel, two of the main metals found in, 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 the, um, in the nodules. So already there are transitions away from expensive, uh, high cost uh, materials uh, that are in relatively short supply to use of low cost, much more abundant and much more diversified uh, metals that are in, in, in much in much greater supply or much more diversified ply, uh, supply. So that's one issue. Another issue is, for example, the International Telecommunications Union puts out a report every, every couple of years or so on electronic waste. And they estimate that of the 50 million tons of electronic waste that's dis that's discarded every year, only about 20%, less than 20% of that is actually recycled. And in a discussion with a, a senior manager at Apple uh, uh, during a, a seminar on deep sea bed mining, he said, we should really be getting that figure up to at least 80% before we even think about going into the deep sea to look for the metals that we would need to build electronics. Um, better product design, more modular products that can be reused, um, better transportation systems. Uh, is the world really going to want to be stuck in traffic jams for the next 30 years with so many cars on the road? Or can we design better transportation systems that in the end use less metals, less materials? But ultimately, it's a question of choices that society will make. Are we going to use metals and materials to build the renewable technologies that are going to come at a high cost to the marine environment or terrestrial environments? Or are we going to find uh, research and design uh, our technologies using much more abundant, low impact metals and materials um, that cost ultimately cost less and can probably get to market much more quickly? And of course, the answer, I think, is, is, is the latter. Thank you very much. And I think we have a very interesting audience here focused on the Pacific. This is at a time where the Pacific can join this conversation. And so I think let's take this question into the context of the Pacific. We have a specific question around what is the impact potentially of deep sea bed mining for small island and large ocean states? Does it affect carbon sequestration and climate change and disasters? And, and how can uh, the legal regime be structured in a way so that these potential transboundary impacts, impacts pollution on contamination of, of seafood, on tourism, et cetera, et cetera, all these potential impacts. How can we, uh, through the moratorium you proposed and through related measures, how can these be structured in a way so that the Pacific Island states, as, a, as an example, uh, can protect themselves from this, these types of threats? Who would like to? Uh, take a first cut at this question. Maybe I start with Sean, because you raised a, a strong voice from the Pacific Islands, and then I'll pass on to Christina to, to address some of the more legal points. I'm actually gonna give Pippa the floor first because I saw her putting up her hand, Torsten, when you, when you raised the question. That's fantastic. Well, then Pippa it is. <laughs> just a very, very um, brief comment, really, is this just, you know, it's, it's really important, as I think I tried to, to explain in, in my presentation, is that you know, there are no boundaries. This is, a, this is very much an, a sort of global issue. And what happens in one part of the ocean will be felt elsewhere. It's very hard to contain. Um, so the transboundary issues are, are, are very, very important to take into, into account when one, you know, it, when the, the ISA, for example, is considering it, but any, any country it decides it wants to take on board contractors or sponsor um, companies who wanting to do this. That you know that the the implications are just vast. So you know I would probably reflect that question back to you know what does it mean in terms of the regulations and the standards and the and the and the and the guidances that are, are in formation at the moment. You know if 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 we don't have the thresholds or at least set the bar high enough. Then you know these implications, these impacts will be felt, you know, well, well beyond small island states and into into the global waters. It will affect the whole system. 
So, I mean, that's just a kind of reflection. It's not really answering the question, but I think it really is about, touches on governance, it touches on everything. I would add to that. Thanks, Pippa. I would add a couple of points to the specific question about carbon sequestration. I think Pippa's presentation actually touched on this quite well. There are there are a couple of ways in which the potential for mining the deep seabed could have significant impacts on the carbon sequestration function of the ocean. And that's both the, the deep seabed as well, the carbon that is sequestered in the deep seabed itself, uh, as well as the carbon pump function that Pippa sort of described. So that is, that is an issue. And that is an issue of sufficient concern to our colleagues and, and, and friends in the Pacific region that this Blue Line Collective that represents the churches and the indigenous groups and women's groups of, of vast millions of people coming together without the deep scientific understanding or without, but with a sense of the value of a healthy ocean for them and the, and, and the value of the importance of uh, the stewardship and, the, and the, the, the sacred legacy was the term that the Reverend used. So how important a healthy ocean is. Um, I would just add as well, um, you know, there's so much uncertainty. There's so much that we don't know. Every time a new scientific expedition goes down into the deep ocean, it comes up with new species, with new information, with new, with new DNA that we've never even seen before. And what we need is, an, is a deep ocean science agenda that is not driven by exploitation or by extraction. And, and that is something I think that would help the Pacific Island countries feeling like they don't need to support, to endorse, to sponsor these mining projects in order to just even find out, in order to answer the question, what's there and how are these ecosystem functions providing natural benefits and, and, and services to us? Thank you, Sean. And I see Christina wants to add on this point as well. Um, well, I was going to address the more um, sober question on the legal regime interaction and opportunities for harmonization. And I think it's important to note that currently um, at, in New York, governments are getting ready to launch the fourth and hopefully final negotiation for this treaty, International Legally Binding Agreement, for the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. There are four key um, elements of this agreement, including area-based management tools, marine, um, such as marine protected areas, but also environmental impact assessments, in, as well as potentially strategic environmental assessments. And these are the tools that you really would want to have in play before new activities like seabed mining actually take off. Um, as in natural ecosystems, redundancy is essential for resilience. Uh, what we're seeing is that the um, sectoral organizations often lack the capacity to step back and truly assess what are the, the social, economic, and environmental impacts that we don't really um, have the opportunity to incorporate. So we need fully comprehensive, consultative, and inclusive consultation processes. And the BB&J agreement, this UN agreement, has the opportunity to set a very high bar uh, to harmonize the approaches used by the multitude of sectoral organizations. So you as local communities, so you as um, the fishing community, so you as the scientists um, and others stakeholders are not left out of these discussions. I think these are critical questions now about informed consent, prior informed consent, and even knowledge-based decision-making. The current um, mechanisms that we have through the International Seabed Authority, they are under development, but it currently, even for exploration phase, they fall well short of international standards and norms. So these negotiations coming up, March 7th are going to be critically important for harmonizing global standards to actually incorporate the key concerns of humanity. Thanks. Thank you very much, Christina. And that brings us nicely to another question around developing country engagements in these processes. To what degree are developing countries actually involved in these decisions around mining? And is there a plan to uh, share potential 
wealth if mining was to take place. Uh, who would like to uh, comment on that question? I see Matt. I'm sure Christina will have plenty to say on this as well, so I'll try to be quick. Um, yes, there is a plan to share the economic wealth, and in fact, this is actually um, hardwired into the Law of the Sea Convention. Unfortunately, as it turns out, the amount of wealth to be shared is going to be very, very little. The Seabed Authority is in the process of deciding to establish regulations for deep sea bed mining with a view to mining, uh, allowing mining on these nodules first. And so they, the International Seabed Authority contracted the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to do an economic analysis of uh, analysis of the economics of nodule mining to allow no negotiators to then decide what the royalty regime will be. Part of the found one of the foundational principles, as Christina mentioned, of the of the seabed mining regime is to share the wealth. Any country that wants to go out there and do the mining has to share some portion of the benefits, the financial benefits, to the rest of the world. Um, in the 70s, they, as Christina indicated, uh, a lot of countries thought they could get rich off this, that, that this would generate huge wealth for humankind as a whole. As it turns out, uh, MIT's analysis has concluded that roughly speaking for each mining license, the amount of money that would be available per country, member of the ISA, per year um, in royalty fees would amount to somewhere around 100 to a few hundred thousand dollars per country per year not millions, not billions, a few hundred thousand. Um, but what the MIT analysis that also showed was that although the amount of money that would be shared to, 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 to all nations that are members of the ISA would be relatively little, uh, uh, the, uh, the countries that actually sponsor, do the mining or sponsor companies to do the mining and the companies themselves could make a lot of money. It could be hugely profitable. So what we're seeing is a number of countries looking at this and saying, we're going to want to get into the mining business, not because we're going to benefit from this general pot of royalties that would be shared out amongst all countries, but because we can make good money off the mining by taxing the companies that have to be incorporated in our jurisdiction in order to get a license from the ISA. And this is going to lead or could lead and very well may lead to a kind of a rush to get there first. First come, first serve, you know, try to get the piece of that pie before others do and make some money off this, which in effect completely undermines the overall idea that the negotiators in the 1970s uh, uh, had in mind when they, when, they, when they negotiated this regime with the view of equity for all in mind. But anyway, Christina, maybe you would want to add to that. Um, well, thank you, Matt. Um, I'm hoping Torsten will, will fill in any gaps that I leave out because um, he's done a the, the, uh, huge amount of work on this topic. But I would say that in terms of developing country participation, the Africa group has been very active in terms of questioning the um, royalty regime that has been put put forward by the um, MIT and the Secretariat of the International Seabed Authority, simply saying that this is insufficient, that if any mining is to take place, there needs to be full and adequate compensation. I have this quote here. A deep sea mining only ever occurs if there is substantial compensation to mankind. And right now, the mining, the proposed financial payment regime is based more on incentivizing mining to occur and offers a, um, I won't say pitifully low, but a very low percentage of any revenue stream to developing countries. And then there's also um, odd questions about how would any money be distributed? Should it be distributed based on population per capita, uh, which would further divide any uh, potential revenue stream um, to small island developing states where it may in fact be needed the most. Uh, so there's huge challenges right now. And I would say it's critically important that developing countries be involved. They are the front lines for the environmental harm uh, and in the red lines in terms of actually seeing any type of real uh, potential revenue stream coming out of seabed mining if it in fact does ever occur. Torsten, back to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christina. And, and I would just add one sentence from one of our participants uh, mentioned as a comment here that there is also the issue of intergenerational equity and how that is integrated and included. So values play a role, intergenerational equity plays a role. So it is a real need to assess the 
uh, overall natural capital. And so we have another comment around that issue, which is linking the question around upwellings of, of coastal systems and the interaction between, for instance, tuna fisheries or cetacean hotspots. So the interaction between uh, pelagic ecosystems and uh, deep sea mining. And so maybe Pitpa, this links uh, nicely to some comments you've made. So maybe you want to expand on that point. Yeah, thanks, Thorsten. I was just about to write something in the chat there on um, to respond. Um, I think I think it's extraordinarily important to recognize the role that um, that, that these trace metals uh, have in in just basic life function and how important they are as as part of our cellular function and and in, in the nutrients that systems that actually you know are so vital for our fisheries, but actually just for ocean health and in, in itself. Um, so highlighting, you know, these these aspects around not only the seamounts but on on sort of upwellings are around massively important uh, from an economic perspective, but also for just basic livelihoods perspective of, of global fisheries is 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 just spot on. Um, yeah, all I can say is just yes, absolutely. Thank you for putting that example in all those examples in, and um, it's just yet another example of. of why we shouldn't be meddling with this. And phosphate mining comes to mind too, because that's another deeply, deeply disturbing um, a, a seabed mining activity, which is done in much shallower waters, but has a very similar effect on, you know, the entire nutrient balance and, and, and the systems that, that I, um, I referred to in my presentation. Thank you. And that actually leads nicely over to a related question, because um, as we talked about regimes, we talked about primarily about manganese nodules, as this is where the first regulatory discussions are taking place. We now address the uh, cobalt uh, crusts on, on the seamounts, but there was a question on the hydrothermal vents, um, whether that one can make this distinction that people have talked about between extinct vent systems versus active vent systems. What would you say about their relevance and, and, and to what degree extinct vent systems uh, create a different type of case? Well, I'd, I'll give a sort of start there because I, you know, I don't think the sulfur massive systems are, are that plentiful. I mean, yes, there, you know, there have been millions of years of, of, of of that of development, but it, they're equally pa um, patchy. Um, the, the live system hydrothermal vents are, are, as I said, quite rare and and quite isolated along the tectonic plates. But um, I think the we, we have to look back, cast back to sort of the environmental impact assessments that were done, for example, by on the Nautilus project, which is which was sulfur massives so off uh, Papua New Guinea, and a lot of the um, implications. And impacts were, were very similar to those described already for, for other systems. It's it's loss of um, of ecosystems. It's loss of, of of biodiversity. Very similar sort of sediment um, production, and you know. So I don't think we can sort of normalize it in any way. It's it's part of the same very destructive nature. And in fact, the machinery that was shown in a couple of our slides were designed to, to, to um, work on sulfur massive systems. Um, so, you know, the impacts and implications of, of putting those types of machines down to try and extract them are, are, are pretty hectic. Um, I don't know, I'm sure others have got other comments to make, but um, the EIAs have shown that there is significant harm. Thank you. Christina, I see your hand up. Uh, yes, one of the benefits of going to uh, many scientific meetings is you sit next to somebody on the bus and you say, hmm, what is the biodiversity of um, extinct hydrothermal vent systems? And they first look at you and say, how do we know this vent system is actually extinct? And then they say, well, actually, we haven't really looked at those because we've been so fascinated by these fiery processes in live ones. Um, and then the third question is, hmm, maybe we actually better start looking at the biodiversity of these, hydro of these extinct hydrothermal vents, which hasn't really happened yet. 
And this is the, the whole concern is um, what we do know about mining of active vents is that it would release highly toxic chemicals into the marine environment. The hydrogen sulfide reacts with the water to start creating um, acids and a whole lot of other things that happen to be toxic to the corals and other creatures uh, nearby. Um, so in terms of the potential for contamination of uh, seafood, of the food chain, I think the concerns are much higher, in fact, for extinct hydrothermal vents, but require, again, very careful study, very careful um, environmental impact assessments, as well as look at the um, alternatives. Thanks. Thank you. And that shows how many issues you have managed to raise in, in this short discussion and presentation. And so a question very pertinent is, well, what can now a citizen do to help preserve this important deep ocean? And how can citizens engage to wake up governments to the seriousness, those governments that may at the moment sit on the sidelines, some governments obviously already very engaged. So um, who would like to take that question, how to engage the wider public? I can start with that. Wait. Matt, you're welcome to. I mean, I, I, I would start with a few sort of top line answers. You know, this, this growing chorus of voices is so important. So the, the discussion, the engagement on social media, the, the in, in the media and the legacy media, have the conversations, inform yourself, learn about it, talk about it, bring it into schools, bring it into your conversations with everybody so that we're all starting to be much more informed and, 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 and outraged and, and challenged by this question of how are we going to, to supply the needs of the future. We should all be part of that conversation. Um, we need to be making more responsible decisions as consumers to the extent that we can, you know, where we, where and how we use technology. Um, and, and importantly, we need to be communicating with our governments, with our government decision makers, asking them what their position is on this and, and indicating that we will be voting accordingly. That would be at least some starting thoughts from my, from my side. Matt, I don't know if you wanted to pick up from there. Yeah, just to add a few things. I mean, as, as Sean has indicated in her presentation, more and more sectors, more and more people are kind of waking up to the fact that, whoa, the world is about to make a momentum decision here uh, as to whether to open up the deep ocean to, to industrial scale mining. And if it does happen, whether we'll ever be able to walk that back or whether we'll be creating a, a global dependency on metals coming from the deep sea. Um, one of the things that we found to be effective is, well, is the IUCN resolution, for example. Um, uh, uh, you know, over 500 organizations, many of whom didn't realize or, or, or even know that this was happening, became aware of the of the issues surrounding deep sea bed mining and the fact that the international sea, their governments at the International Seabed Authority are trying to move the world in this direction uh, and voted for a moratorium. And I think. This kind of initiative, carrying it into other uh, uh, fora, such as the CBD in its debates and, and negotiations over marine and coastal biodiversity decisions coming up at the Substa meeting next month and on into COP15 later in the year, um, bringing this up uh, at meetings of the ISA. You know, when it, for those of you who are interested in this, the ISA meetings are webcast. You will see your own government representatives speaking on this issue. Some will come out and call for precaution and conservation. Others will say, we need to go mining. You can challenge those statements. You can challenge them on social media. You can call up your minister, your government officials and say, why is our country taking this position? And one of the things that we found as NGOs is that you can if, if, if you get engaged at the national level with your government, um, we, what we have been able to do has been to force open a civil society debate. Most governments, are, well, many governments often go to the ISA meetings with kind of a predetermined positions that have not been debated within society. Nobody has challenged them to say, hey, we want a consultation here before you go. What is going to be the position of our government on this? Are you going to call for a moratorium? Are you promoting deep sea bed mining? Why? It's not needed. So who's going to benefit um, and finally, just to say, coming back to the economic arguments, one of the, 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 the issues that's now coming through, in addition to, in a very important 
uh, point that Torsten, you raised and others on intergener intergenerational equity is the fact that the deep sea bed mining might represent in the end a net loss to humankind as a whole. Loss of ecosystem goods and services, loss of biodiversity, loss of marine genetic, re genetic resources in the deep ocean that could be used to develop new drugs uh, or new products, et cetera, and so forth. So, so you know, there's there there are lots of avenues to open up this debate. You know, we have uh, uh, organizations in India that are that are that are that are challenging their government on the equity issue. Um, and and again, citizen involvement in this through NGOs in your countries that can raise these issues with your governments, direct uh, uh, discussions with your elected officials uh, or your appointed civil servants, all of that can help. Thank you very much. And we know we're going to, oh, Sean, would you like to follow up on that? Sorry, can I just add one more point? And it sort of touches on another question that has come up in the Q&A as well, Torsten. Um, the, other, the other discussion that we haven't really touched on is, is, is the, how the proposal to mine the deep sea connects with land-based mining, right? With existing mining, with terrestrial mining. Um, and and it's, a, it's a tricky subject because it's actually not either or, right? There are those who would like to position this as the answer to the environmental and social uh, and governance issues of land-based mining. But there is no evidence that opening up the deep sea to, to mining would in any way replace terrestrial mining. And what it might actually do is even create greater environmental, social and governance issues for land-based mining, because it might put downward pressure, at least temporarily, on prices um, if, if there's a, a whole new supply of minerals coming out of the deep sea. And then that would make it that much harder for the, for the terrestrial companies to actually take the necessary uh, ESG action to really improve land-based mining practices. So when we work with uh, groups that are active and that have been active for many years on the terrestrial mining front, what we're hearing, and especially from the smaller groups, from the, from the local groups, is don't stop the mining on land necessarily, improve it, make it safer, make it environmentally better, improve it. Um, so that's just an important point as well when you ask how individuals can get involved and, and that's also, you know, get involved in ensuring that the mineral supply chains that are already out there are better. Thank you very much. And I think that also, uh, Matt raised again the, the resolution itself. And I think, Pippa, you played such an important role in getting the resolution moved forward. Maybe you can tell us briefly uh, just summarize sort of key points from the resolution and also put it in the context of next steps. We have the CBD meetings coming up in the next few weeks. There are multiple ways to, to spread this, this message. So, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll pass over to you to, to speak about that for a moment. Thanks very much. And I'm going to ask Christina to, to add to some of the, the, the details too. But I mean, the important thing about the the resolution that, that came out of the motion 69 of the uh, World Conservation Congress is that it really is now IUCN policy and this is something that members need to respond to. Um, Forum for International is one of the um, um, longest standing members actually of IUCN, we're about 120 something years old now, but uh, yes, so it's been, been there since the beginning of the IUCN anyway, um, is that, you know, we, we've taken our on, on responsibility to start engaging. We're very active in, in, in lobbying our government, in, in, in helping to understand, to, to, to raise awareness around and being involved with the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition and, and beyond that. But really what the, the uh, resolution is calling for is um, there are a number of things and focused on essentially, you know, making sure that there is independent science, that there is, there is time and effort is given to um, increasing the body of knowledge that um, helps us to apply the precautionary principle and make good decisions. There, there is a lot in there about the need to reform the governance structure of the ISA. It's just, um, as Matt and, and others have said so clearly this evening, or morning, wherever, whatever time zone we're in, is that, you know, there are massive inadequacies in, in, in the ISA. So, so this is something that the resolution is, is calling for. 
um, but we need a lot of transparency and decision making. We need um, everybody to be involved, and that is from from all members and, and nation states. But actually, that we need to start participating and um, making sure that you know this nascent industry does not progress without due consideration and, and application of all the um, you know the, the the due process that's required. Um, Christina, can you add to that? Um, Actually, if you don't mind, before yeah. we move to Christina and how this resolution now affects IUCN in their action, there was one more question in, in, in the Q&A that uh, we, we haven't addressed, but I thought fits in quite nicely to what you were mm. explaining in terms of these criteria, which is the, the question, what would it take for the moratorium to reach its natural end? Is, is there a process? Could you see such an end coming? Is, is that something that people have started thinking about? I mean, that's quite a controversial question, and but it's a really important one because not not everybody, I think, is 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 equally on on um, you know the, the same sort of page, or in, not not in not in this group particularly. But I think that um, there is too much that we know about the impacts and risks right now for deep sea mining to go ahead. So the moratorium is really calling from on those kind of conditionalities in a way that were set out in the motion. And that those are the things that are, are, are being called for in, in the resolution. Um, whether or not that ends up, you know, indicating that there can, there is, uh, you know, a no harm outcome or that there are certain thresholds that, that scientifically can be proven around the impacts and risks of, of seabed mining need to be answered and that can only be answered in the future with, with more than we have um, at hand right now. But um, yeah, th there is only one answer uh, for that right now and is this, you know, with what we know and, and, and the, what we know of the, the impacts and risks, it, it, it's not an industry that should proceed. But uh, you know, my, my colleagues, I'm sure, will have a um, you know answers to that question too. Thank you very much, Pippa. So, Christina, I didn't want to stop you there, but um, I think for IUCN, once it's a resolution, it's a mandate. How do you interpret that? How can this be taken forward now? That's well, um, as a, the policy now of the IUCN, it's important for IUCN and its membership to take this message to other organizations. That was uh, to the meetings that we're attending, to the meetings that our membership are, is attending, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity, the subsidiary body on scientific, technical, and technological advice, and to make sure that the debate is public, it's inclusive, it's informed, and it actually makes a difference. Um, the venues may range from the Convention on Biological Diversity to the United Nations Environment Assembly to the United Nations General Assembly, which is in fact charged with overseeing the implementation of the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, the issues will come up in sort of the um, many of the inherent contradictions between what we're trying to achieve in the BB&J agreement and the unleashing of a potentially destructive activity without effective environmental effect, um, impact assessment processes. Um, the IUCN resolution is framed in um, a variety of condition precedents, very legal term, that unless and until we actually can comprehensively understand the potential impacts and control them to ensure effective protection. It means vast development of the technologies for uh, mining as well as for monitoring the changes. Uh, the precautionary principle, ecosystem approach, polluter pays. It means that those who would cause pollution of the marine environment need to be charged for it. And if we implement the precautionary principle, it means that we actually don't act until we know. The re assuming responsible production is not to be forgotten. It's part as well as the public consultation mechanisms. And also the reform of the International Seabed Authority is a fundamental need to make sure that we do not have private interests driving the um, operation of an institution charged with operating on behalf of humankind as a whole. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. And as we're coming to the end and as there is so much that needs doing and we have a very clear mandate here, let's try to find the last round of 
making it clear, coming up with a call for action, uh, is each one of you to give us a, a, a clear message and call so that our audience can go away and help us move this uh, moratorium work forward. And uh, Sean, shall I start with you? Sure. Um, thank you, Torsten. I, I'm actually going to channel Jessica as well. So for, from my side, I, I would like to I would like to repeat what I said when you asked me that question earlier on, which is that deep seabed mining is at the at present, the way it's currently structured, in no way sustainable. It cannot be. So it's an oxymoron to try and 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 find sustainability in deep seabed mining at the moment. Um, and then I'd like to just mention as well what Jessica said in answer to that question, which is just to recall the, the words of, of the Reverend uh, and, and in particular, and, and respecting some of the contributions from our Pacific participants in this, in this webinar and over the last hour, um, that, that the cultural values and the legacy, the, the, the custodianship, the, the, the traditional and cultural values of the ocean should not be forgotten as we consider this question. Thank you very much. And who would like to go next? Pippa. I'm happy to. Yeah, my my thought is really just the the, the very nature of, of the oceans is it's highly connected. It is vast. It is uh, it is very well. It's in, it would be impossible to isolate a single mining operation in one part of the ocean from what um, happens at a system level and the implications for that on on our whole planetary health. Um, and that's. The part that really has motivated my engagement in in this issue and that um you, you know we we really would all be affected by something by by deep sea mining if it was to take place so you know just be aware of the orders of magnitude of the implications thank you very much very sobering thoughts um matt uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come back. I'll, 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 I'll respond to that question similar uh, to the last time around. Um, the good news is that the International Seabed Authority uh, is comprised of 167 member countries plus the European Union. It's a multilateral body. And the international community of nations, such as it is, um, and these days it's a little bit uh, uh, difficult to say that uh, given what's going on today, but nonetheless, has risen to the challenge of dealing with environmental issues on a global basis. The moratorium on drift nets established by the United Nations General Assembly in 1992 largely eliminated that problem on the high seas. Probably one of the best examples is the fact that in the 1980s, the nations that were members of the Antarctic Treaty System were negotiating a mining regime to open up Antarctica to mining. And toward the end of the 1980s, through enlightened leadership, primarily initiated by Australia and, and France, um, those negotiations shifted to an agreement to establish a 50-year moratorium on mining the Antarctic continent. So I'm optimistic, even though it's a huge lift, but it is possible for the, the nations of the world that are members of the ISA to come together and say, you know, what the negotiation negotiators in the 1970s at the height of the Cold War, based on in, incorrect information in terms of biodiversity and so forth, thought was a good idea then is not a good idea now. We don't have to be beholden to what they agreed to 45 to 50 years ago. We can change that and we can change that for the better. And we'll put this whole process onto a pause, get the kind of information that Pippa was talking about and come back to it maybe in 20 or 30 years and say, okay, now do we have enough information to make informed decisions as to whether we can mine without doing damage to the marine environment? Does the world still need or think it may need to mine or can we do get what we need from improved terrestrial mining and better use of the minerals and materials and metals that we already have. And, and so, but it's going to take political pressure. It's going to take political engagement uh, to do this, but it may be that, you know, the world can make this decision. And in fact, the, 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 the nations that are members of the ISA really have to come to terms with a decision along these lines at some point in the next year to two, to two years because of the so-called triggering of the two-year rule. So, you know, a big lift, but it's not impossible. And, and you know, the, the international system has done this before. Uh, we can do it again. 
Thank you very much, Matt. And Christina, for your final message, I'll also throw at you the final question that just arrived in our Q&A, which is in legal language, is there a difference between a moratorium and a stay? So answer the question and your final words, and then we'll pass on to Minna to close us all off and thank all of you for your brilliant contributions. Uh, well, you could actually have a, a stay. It is the same as a pause, basically, of um, holding progress from going forward. Um, yes, many would interpret a moratorium as a ban. And I think um, there is a diverse range of views of people calling for an actual ban versus those saying that a pause is what we need right now. Where we end up is um, what we need to decide right now. Um, I have other colleagues in the World Commission on Environmental Law who are actually trying to develop um, the concept of a new international crime against humanity of ecocide. That's ecocide being the unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. So really the question we have to answer to um, ourselves is do we want to be the generation that the next generation may be accusing of causing this horrible crime? So we have some big decisions ahead. Thank you. Certainly do. Thank you so much. And may I ask Minna Epps to close us off. Thank you so much for to everyone in this great discussion. Thank you, Torsten, and thanks to all our excellent, uh, our panelists and our expert for all your insightful full comments. I think it's been a really interesting 90 minutes, and it also really shows how important this topic is and how it's really emerging. And it's also um, be increasingly becoming more important also on the political, um, has entered the political stage, but uh, I still think we have quite a lot to do in terms of uh, general public uh, awareness on, on the issue of debit mining. They seem to be quite absent. But um, I liked some of um, Matt's positive uh, note there to end on, which is really lo looking at enlightened leadership. So we need enlightened leadership from, from governments, I mean, political leaders, but also from civil society and, you know, um, businesses. Well, we've seen excellent examples. There is president. Uh, it has done it has been done before. And so I was really delighted that IUCN could host this meeting and really open up and convene this kind of dialogue, which is really important. Um, and I'd like to also say that IUCN has been really involved in the policy and been attending the I ISA meetings. And there's one coming up as well at the end of next month um, with the aim of really promoting and pushing for a precautionary principle, but also the mitigation hierarchy. Uh, but now this is, um, we have um, a mandate in terms of our policy position on deep seabed mining, and we will be present at these international upcoming meetings and debates when we put this forward. Um, so really grateful for all the work that you do uh, and the expertise that you have brought to the table. Uh, and again, really like to focus and emphasis on also in intergenerational um, the, uh, equity. So thank you very much. And uh, I wish you all uh, a great day or an evening for those of us. So it's very late here in Europe. Um, once again, thank you very much. And we will provide a link to the recording and all materials that have been presented. We will be happy to share with you as well as links to report. So thank you very again until next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.